Linguists have just made a tremendous breakthrough, and now we are one step closer to defining what a word is. Does that sound like a joke? Because it's not a joke. And I cannot get over how interesting and how fun this brand new paper in the most recent issue of language is. It's the culmination of years of research across multiple universities and has empirical evidence that literally blows our description of words out of the water. It's in conversation with a paper that really stuck with me from a few years back with the delightfully memorable title, The Lexicalist Hypothesis, both superfluous and wrong. I mean, how can you beat that? So today, we're going to look at the results of an empirical study that's based on the hypothesis that maybe our whole understanding of parts of speech is wrong or incomplete. It's a you do it every day, but don't even know you do it grammatical structure. And it's been a very real challenge to traditional categories in generative linguistics. I remember having a this doesn't make sense moment early in grad school in syntax. And this paper finally addresses that. As usual, it also weighs in on a bigger issue, in this case, constructionist versus minimalist approaches to syntax, but that's something for the 12 people who really care about it to argue in more of a comment, really, questions at conferences. If you're new to the channel, I'm Dr. Taylor Jones. I've got a PhD in linguistics from the University of Pennsylvania, and on the channel, I discuss everything related to language, linguistics, language learning, and culture. If you're into those topics, be sure to subscribe and ring the bell for notifications. Today we're talking about the phrase as lemma construction. Oh my god, I, I just realized they're doing the thing in the title. It's the thing in the thing. Anyway, we're talking about the phrase as lemma construction and the paper arguing when a phrase masquerades as a word, people play along. This is Language Jones. Today's video is brought to you by Lingoda. I absolutely love Lingoda. Lingoda is an online language school with live classes taught by real, certified, native-level teachers in Spanish, French, Italian, German, and English. I've used them to brush up my French, to dabble in Spanish, and to really accelerate my learning Italian from zero this summer, to being able to navigate hotels, cafes, gas stations, parking reservations, you name it, when we flew to Italy. I did a sprint before traveling, and I am so grateful for the lessons on making appointments and communicating preferences. I use that content literally every day, and it saved me from some difficult situations. La mia bevanda preferita è il prosecco. Non esiste kosher, credo. Esiste, ma è difficile a trovare, ma esiste. Certo, esiste. certo. Yeah. Lingoda has small group classes, so you get personalized feedback, and they have flexible scheduling 24-7. Their current promotion is a sprint. You can choose between 30 classes in 60 days, or 60 classes in 60 days, the so-called super sprint. The best part, aside from how much you learn, is that you get 50% cash back or equivalent credits when you complete the sprint successfully. So imagine how good you'll be after a brisk hour a day with an expert teacher for the next 60 days. You could be speaking quickly and confidently before the end of the year, or before finals. If that sounds right to you, be sure to use my discount code for $25 off. What are you waiting for? Hurry up before the sign-up closes. Okay, so just a quick point is in order. When people find out I'm a linguist, they almost invariably assume that I'm either a translator, thanks the military for calling translators and interpreters linguists, and they ask how many languages I speak, or they say something like, you must be judging my grammar. I'll be careful how I speak around you. Neither has much relation with what linguists actually do. I often explain that it's the study of language, capital L, and that it's descriptive. We don't care what you do, but we do want to categorize and study the patterns. Biologists don't think ocelots are just really shitty tigers or whatever. They're interested in how they're similar, how they differ, their common ancestry, the range of morphologies, convergent and divergent evolution, theoretical stuff, and so on. Same with language. Usually then, people are like, isn't that all basically settled? And I get to bust out. Linguists can't even agree on what a word is. Now, you're probably thinking that it's pretty obvious. We put spaces around all the words, so anything you write with a space around it is a word. Done and dusted. Not so fast. First, most languages in the history of the world don't have a writing system, and those that do don't always or often separate words. So then you might think it's like sounds that go together and have a meaning. And sure, that could work. But then you have this problem like, what's the ul in you'll say? Because you can say you will say, three words, but you can also say, you'll say. Historically, those are called clitics, which just means that they lean on a real world, on a real word, and don't happen on their own because they're a phonologically reduced form, simplified, easier sounds. But then there's also the problem of languages like Zulu that have tons of clitics on one main concept, like, I will give it to you, and it gets one primary stress and pitch pattern. Bantuists would generally call that a word, but the exact same patterns in French 
Onchoclitics, one main phonological prominence, is considered four words. And it goes the other way, where Mandarin speakers have meaningful units where one syllable corresponds to one character, and very often to one idea, but a word like teacher might be composed of two of those bad boys. Yes, teacher is two morphemes in English, teach and er, but we don't separate er and write it as its own word and all that jazz. So words are a minefield, and into the fray launch Goldberg and Schertz. Their basic contention, building on the work of Benjamin Bruning and others, is, yo dog, I heard you like words in your words, so here's some more words in your words. Their contention is, fuck it, let's make a sentence a word. Their contention is, why not sentences all the way down? So Bruning argued that our categories for words and even the whole enterprise of assuming that syntax operates on lexical items, that is, grammar is moving words around, is, as he puts it, superfluous and wrong. And to defend that assertion, he adduces tons of evidence from sentences like the following. The old dog ate my homework trick won't work because I know you don't have one. Or I gave her a don't you dare look. Or she baked her fiance a sweet I love you cake. Or his general okay with less than we should aim for this makes him an undesirable candidate. Or the adverb agent and commandingly, burning cites an alarming amount of Archer in the paper. He gets into some serious syntactic tests and the kind of logical tinkering with language that linguists love but that makes everybody else's eyes bleed, like swapping out words or parts of speech, trying to coordinate with anaphores, messing around with ellipses, and just seeing what breaks, and more interestingly, what doesn't. And based on the fact that you can say something like a stop and chat, he kind of just breaks our understanding of grammar. What part of speech does an indefinite article like a modify? A noun. What part of speech is stop and chat? Sure looks like two coordinated verb phrases. What? He also points to coordination across ellipses, things like you can pre and remix it. Ellipses, elision? Yeah. That are doing the exact inverse, treating things we usually think of as less than a word as a word. And he argues that, to put it simply, words don't reel. I loved that paper. You should have seen me rip the plastic off the new issue of Language with Glee when the phrase's lemma construction arrived. My wife thought that I was excitedly unwrapping a present that a normal person would enjoy. The paper was a blast, if only for the number of fun examples they brought to bear, including a trickle-down policy, a must-do task, the both-sides-do-it argument, an I'm-not-a-witch moment, the how-does-it-feel game, a you-both-win moment, a take-music-for-granted attitude, the stop-making-more-games argument, his at some point we've all parked in the wrong garage speech, the punishment is good for everyone else but not my little angel attitude, and that's just example one in the introduction. I found myself quoting entire sections of a technical linguistics paper to my in-laws while visiting them because it was just so fun. For example, in example 11, Colbert treats the event of the actress's owl coughing up rat hairballs on the singer-songwriter as if it were familiar enough to be a lemma named by a word. This type of case, in which the situation is not in reality at all familiar, but is treated as if it were, exemplifies Keller's, 1994, page 97, observation that people at least sometimes aim to, quote, talk in such a way that you are noticed. Sanchez, Stockhammer, and Urig, 2023, memorably discuss British drunkenims. Someone at a pub may be totally gazeboed or utterly pajamaed. They observe that new terms can be coined in a suitable context to describe a state of drunkenness, regardless of the typical meaning of the filler word. I was completely pajamaed. I literally at one point was like, this is why I got into linguistics. But they make a broader point and they do it with empirical data. First, they establish the existence of these constructions and situate everything in the existing literature slash argument, classic. Then they describe the results of an acceptability rating experiment along with a survey they asked participants about how they perceived such sentences. This is new. Unsurprisingly, there's a climb from very unmarked and unremarkable sentences like a can-do attitude or stay in your seats until the fasten seatbelt sign has turned off, all the way to extremely marked and unusual like don't there it is me, buddy, or dredging up the old you guys do it too defense is the weakest form of deflection. What they found was that these constructions work by, to borrow their word, masquerading as a word. That is, they seem like they refer to a known concept or entity, but they get used precisely because they don't refer to a known concept or entity, but rather one that can be deduced from context. It's like a little puzzle for your brain. The authors talk about Stephen Colbert saying, Meanwhile, in Selma Hayek's Al coughed a rat hairball in Harry Styles news, the joke, this kills the joke, is that that's not a normal news category. We'd expect local news or sports news or whatever, and instead we get this whole sentence which is highly specific, and the implication that not only would we recognize this as a category, but that we might be able to populate it with multiple instances, 
or want updates on it. So what these constructions do is invite us to accommodate the speaker by going along with an ad hoc improvised conceptual category. And they're often humorous. Goldberg and Schertz spend a fair amount of time dissecting observational humor. Think Seinfeld in the 90s. And liken these constructions to, well, that. I'm surprised they didn't quote more Robin Williams, honestly. What they found is that people are aware of the artificiality of some of these constructions, but not others. But in all cases, they overwhelmingly perceive them as more witty and more sarcastic than a, I'm talking like a regular person, paraphrase. They build on all of this to argue that, one, construction grammar is a better approach to theoretical syntax than generative minimalism, what I was trained in. And two, we should acknowledge these constructions as their own special thing and not try to shoehorn them into another part of speech. So sometimes a sentence is behaving like an adjective, but it's not an adjective, it's a sentence. There's a lot more in the paper, including comparable examples from other languages, but the big takeaways for me are, one, sometimes phrases can be adjectives or behave like them, and behave like what I might naively think of as a single word. And this means that our understanding of grammatical categories has to be recursive in a kind of fractally mind-bending way. This is not strictly new to me, but these examples get really mind-blowing. Two, people are aware of the weirdness and view these kinds of phrases as wittier and more sarcastic than well-behaved paraphrases in a way that relates to observational humor. And three, and this is where I bring my personal proclivities to bear on this, it's a social act. There's a social function of inviting the hearer to co-construct a shared perspective by generating new conceptual categories on the fly. The social world is affecting our syntax. It's time for my, if you like what I'm doing with the channel spiel. See, I'm doing it. You're not gonna be able to unnotice these. Leave me a comment with your favorite, by the way. Oh, and I almost forgot, the Brunning paper actually attempted to tackle my favorite problem construction. I want the this, not the that. Anyway. Languages are so weird and linguistics can be so entertaining sometimes. So if you like what I'm doing with the channel, you can support it on YouTube with super thanks or over on Patreon at patreon.com slash language Jones. Please leave a comment. They are great for the algorithm and subscribe if you haven't already. Until next time, stay curious and happy learning. Do you guys want more of these where I summarize paywalled papers that I have access to while I'm keeping up to date on the most recent research? Could be a fun thing. Leave me a comment with the word paywall in it, and I'll see what I can do.